We're still in section 5.1, but I'm calling it 5.1b because I want to view it as being the second half of section 5.1. So I'm calling it part 1 of 5.1b, and we're going to now start talking about finite sets. I'll give the definition of finite sets, and I will quote a few theorems for you. Uh, in, this, in the remaining lectures for this section, I'm mostly just going to state definitions and state theorems. I'm not going to include the proofs at this point. The reason is the results are really quite intuitively obvious. I think you'll accept them pretty easily. But they turn out to be rather technical. Um, they take pages to do. Most are done using the um, principle of mathematical induction. So I really don't want you to get lost in the details at this point. I, I want you to know the results for finite sets so that you can really appreciate what we're going to do for infinite sets where the results are a little bit more surprising. So later on I'll add the lectures. Um, after we're done I'll add the lectures which give the missing proofs, but um, not before you've first seen the theory of infinite sets. So here we uh, give a basic definition. Um, we give ourselves a natural number little n and we define n sub n to be the set of all natural numbers from 1 up to n. And the idea of introducing these sets is that we're going to um, use them to compare other finite sets to these things. So here now is the fundamental definition of what a finite set is. If A is a set, then we say that it's finite if either it's empty or there exists a natural number little n such that a has the same cardinality as n sub n. So by definition, if it's a non-empty finite set, then this must be true. There has to exist a natural number little n such that it is has the same cardinality as n sub n, as this set here. We would then like to be able to say that A has n elements in it, if this is the case. But there's some technical work to be done before we can do that. Um, namely, we have to show that it's impossible for there to be two different ends uh, for which A satisfies something like this. In other words, you want to show that there can exist different integers n1 and n2 such that A is um, equivalent to both of them. It may seem obvious to you that that can't happen, but actually it really does require some proof. This is an example of something I mentioned to you on the previous slide when I said that a lot of the results are rather technical, but um, in principle they, they, the results themselves seem rather obvious, that you, you know in your heart that they have to be true. But let me state um, the theorem that would be needed in order to actually um, say that, um, that there can't exist two different such integers, n1 and n2. It's actually quite a famous result known as the pigeonhole principle. So the pigeonhole principle says that given any pair of natural numbers, m and n, if m is bigger than n, then it's impossible for there to be an injection from n sub m to n sub n. n sub m is just too big. If you try to map m, n sub m into n sub n, at least two of the um, integers would have, or at least two of the natural numbers would have to go to the same um, element of this set. So it's sort of like you've got these, um, you have uh, n pigeonholes, but you have m pigeons, and uh, m pigeons are going to go into these pigeonholes, and if there are more pigeons than pigeonholes, then at least two of them have to wind up in the same pigeonhole. Um, the other result is sort of the opposite. If m is smaller than n, then it's impossible for there to be a surjection from n sub m to n sub n. You can't make it onto. You just don't have enough uh, elements in this set to completely cover the n sub n. So again, both of these would seem on the surface to be completely obvious, but actually if you write up the proof, the the inductive proof of it, it's it, it's rather messy and it, um, it, it takes some time to do it. So I'm just going to state the theorem at this point. But as a corollary of this, you get that if A is any finite non-empty set, then there must be exactly one N such that um, A is 
equivalent to n sub n. There can't be more than one. And this is easy enough that I, I think I'll just show you the proof of that fact. So if A is a finite non-empty set, and suppose it were the case that there exist natural numbers m and n, such that A is equivalent to n sub n, and A is equivalent also to n sub n. Well, we know that uh, this relation is both symmetric and transitive, so the fact that this is true and this is true, um, we could then deduce from the symmetry that we can reverse the order of these two things, and then we can apply transitivity to deduce that we get this. So that means that there would be a bijection from n sub m to n sub n. Now if you look at part A, and you just take the contrapositive of that, the contrapositive says for all m and n, uh, if there exists an injection from n m to n sub n, then m must be less than or equal to n. So since we've got this bijection, it is in particular an injection, and therefore m must be less than or equal to n. Now if you do the same thing with part B, just look at the contrapositive of this. For all m and n, if there exists a surjection from here to here, then m must be bigger than or equal to n. And that's what we have, again, because we have a bijection, and therefore m must be also bigger than or equal to n, therefore m must equal n. So that means the thing that we're calling n here is, is unique, because any other one for which you could do it um, turns out to be equal to n. Now, with that corollary, we can now make the following definition. We can talk about what we mean by the cardinality of a finite set. If A is a finite set, then we can define the cardinality of A, and we denote it by A with um, two bars over the top of it, A double bar. A double bar is zero if A is empty, and it's N if N is the unique natural number for which this is the case. Okay, according to the previous corollary, we know that there is such a thing. We know that there's at least one if it's finite, just by definition of finite, and the corollary guarantees that there's exactly one such thing. So the cardinality of a finite set is a non-negative integer, and what does it represent? It represents what we would call the number of elements in the set. In other words, you don't go wrong if you define what you mean by number of elements in a finite set. You only get in trouble when you talk about number of elements in an infinite set. So just to practice with this notation so that you get used to it, let's just do a few simple examples. So this notation means it's asking for the cardinality or the the cardinality of this set here. In other words, how many distinct elements are there in it? There's one, two, three, four, five. I've already counted that one. Six, seven, and I've already counted five. So the cardinality of that set is seven. And of course the cardinality of n sub n is n. That's, that's obvious. So let me just mention the use of the term cardinality. You know, how are you allowed to use this term cardinality? So we already introduced the term in the, in earlier lecture. We, we, we say two sets, A and B, have the same cardinality. That's provided there's a bijection from one to the other. So we don't talk about necessarily the cardinality of A by itself or the cardinality of B by itself. We just say the two sets have the same cardinality. We're using the term cardinality in this sense as a means of comparing the sets. But in case the set is actually finite, then we really can refer to the cardinality of the set as representing the number of elements in the set. So at this point, we can only use the term cardinality of a set if we know that the set is finite.